Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, uh, it's nearly five past, so we may as well uh, kick off. Um, so it's a great pleasure to, to welcome Mike Hicks uh, from Maryland, um, uh, who's uh, sort of passing through. And um, so I think he's going to give us a sneak preview of his uh, latest and greatest popple paper. So, Mike. Thank you very much. Always fun to come by. So this is joint work uh, with Andrew Miller, who's a grad student at the University of Maryland, and then also my colleagues Elaine Shi and Jonathan Katz. So uh, this talk is about authenticated data structures. So many of you might wonder, what is that? Um, the idea of an authenticated data structure can uh, be illustrated by this example, which, uh, as we'll find out toward the end, is what's called a Merkle tree. Uh, the idea is that the server is going to maintain some amount of data, say, as a tree. And at the client, you'll maintain some much smaller amount of data, a hash, that uh, is used to uh, spearhead queries to the server. And your goal as a client is to be able to submit queries to the server, for example, a fetch query, and get an answer back and be able to confirm after receiving the answer that uh, it's actually authentic, that the server did not uh, lie about the answer that it's giving you. And it's going to do this by recomputing some cryptographic hashes. So I haven't explained what the data structure on the left is doing. Uh, each of the nodes in this complete tree has uh, hashes stored at it, as you can see, and the leaves of the tree have strings. So you can think of this as implementing a random access array, where the fetch2 query is basically you can read that as a bunch of bits, where it will follow the path down the tree that's uh, bolded there to get uh, index2 inside of this array to return the result. Now the proof that's sent back, these three little uh, um, ovals here on the right, um, include hashes that were gathered along the path to returning the result. And these hashes are then used by the client to confirm that the result makes sense. So the first is the string itself. Uh, that's the returned result. And that can be combined with the second thing, h7, in order to confirm uh, the hash h3 in the tree. So in other words, what the verifier will do, what the client will do, is it, he will take the hash of, of str2 and he will take uh, h7, and he will concatenate them together and reproduce for himself h3, which is the blue node there in the tree. Having, being get, having uh, redetermined what h3 is, he can then take h2, which is the node on the other side of the tree, which is provided in the, truth, in the proof, concatenate those together, compute the hash, and therefore reproduce h1, uh, which is the root of the tree. Now, remember, he started with h1, which is there on the right. And so if all of these hashes uh, work out, the client has now confirmed that the, the server actually did the right thing, assuming that it would be very difficult for the server to have reconstructed these hashes in some other way, that is, to have found a, a hash collision. Question? Yeah. So I'm not quite sure what you mean by the right thing. All it seems that you've proved is that the server followed the tree. That's right. That's, that's the goal. We, we just want to make sure that the server did actually, if, if the tree that I have the hash for, h1 there in the upper right, represents the tree that the server really has, and I say to the server, please give me the second element in the tree, I can confirm the server didn't give me the third element in the tree instead. What it did was the server had to have followed that path and had to have given me the actual results, stir 2 there at the end. So the client knows nothing about the shape of the tree initially, just knows that there is a tree whose hash is h1. That's right. That's right. So you can, you can ask, you can wonder, well, Sorry. so what, what might you use this for? Why don't I uh, tell you what you can use it for, and then you'll sit. But he could have followed a completely different path down the tree, the server could have. Yes. Provided he handed back all the hashes hanging off the path. Right, that except following the different path would have given you the wrong answer. And uh, because the, the bottom here, I'm taking the hash of the answer, stir 2, and therefore um, if the server took a different path, but return stir 2, well, what do I care? If they took a different path and returned stir 1, then the hashes wouldn't match up. Sure, it would, but you would have returned h4 and h3 on this path. I mean, you just returned the hashes that, you just returned a different set of hashes in the green and the blue boxes. 
the ordering in the hash function matters. Yes, the, the oh. concaten concatenation here is left, right. Um, when you're when you're computing the hash of these two things, if you'd gone the other way, then the, the hashes wouldn't have matched up. Oh, the order of this hash. Oh, okay. So it specifies the path of the tree. I see. Okay. So, what does the client uh, ask for specifically? It's uh, the two number. Or? The client is asking for whatever is at this this location, fetch two. So this is uh, this two here just represents in binary notation the the path through the tree. Left left is zero, right is one. So the client asks for one particular uh, leaf, and it gets a proof for that leaf. Yes, that's okay. right. Right. Um, okay. So as I was saying, this is a this is a Merkle tree. So this was invented quite a while ago. And um, why why might you want to use one of these things? Uh, well, here's one example: uh, trustworthy trustworthy mirroring and duplication. Suppose that you have uh, a list. You have a, a set of things that are important. For example, all the Tor relay servers. And you want to be able to mirror that list so that uh, people can get the answer to their queries, what's the nearest Tor Relay server to me, uh, from any server rather than the one trusted server that's known to maintain the correct list. So right now there is one trusted list that uh, NRL maintains of all of the Tor Relays, which is a pain because now everybody in the world has to contact NRL to find out what the closest relays to, to them might be. So if we use authenticated data structures, what we can do is the uh, trusted list can publish the hash of the root of its data structure. All the clients will have the hash of the trusted data structure, and then they can go to all of these untrusted servers to confirm that they're actually getting the proper answers to their queries, right? So they can have confirmed, uh, confirmed answers. And you can imagine this sort of trustworthy mirroring working in other cases too, like with public key servers or um, uh, for distributed file systems. So that's what the Tahoe LAFS mutable file system is for. Uh, right, any time that you want to have a server store things for you and answer queries for you where you don't necessarily trust the server, but you have a root of trust from something that you do trust, for example, this trusted uh, server that's being mirrored, then you can use an authenticated data structure to do that mirroring reliably. Uh, another place where this happens is Bitcoin. I'm sure everyone has heard of uh, Bitcoin before. Bitcoin uses a form of authenticated data structure to confirm that transactions over the global ledger of uh, Bitcoin transactions are authentic, and that's because it's a peer-to-peer -peer distributed system, and we don't want to go to one centralized place to be able to confirm uh, whether uh, a transaction is valid or not, and so instead we can use authenticated data structures uh, to do that. So I'll show you an example of how Bitcoin works in terms of the language I'm about to introduce to you uh, at the end of the talk. So what could a version of the tool relay would be to say, oh, lots of untrusted clients can have the relay directory, and we'll publish the ha its hash and if anybody wants to access it, they say to an untrusted cloud, give me the directory, and he gives you the whole directory and the hash, and now he can verify it. And what you're doing here is you're saying, no, we don't have to hand over the whole directory. We can hand over just a little piece and a, and a proof. That's right. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Good explanation. Okay, so um, it turns out that, uh, as I said, this is an old idea, this authenticated data structures idea, and uh, there have been many variants of authenticated data structures developed over time. So Merkle trees was the first, but since then people have developed authenticated skip lists and authenticated red-black trees and authenticated bee trees, and each one of these new authenticated data structures has warranted a new top-tier paper in some crypto conference. And why is that? Well, it's because every one of them developed the whole idea from scratch. They designed the data structure, the, the representation, they designed all of the methods, the, the queries and so on for that data structure. And then in a heroic effort, they constructed a proof to say why all of these methods are going to give you the answer that you expect. Um, so our observation was, well, why do we keep doing that? We, we have programming languages for a reason. Can we not develop a programming language in which we could code up these data structures so that by virtue of coding it up in our language, we'll get this authenticity property in the way that we want? And of course, I'm here, so the answer is yes. So the language that we develop, we call Lambda Auth. It's a purely functional uh, ML-like programming language. Uh, as you'll see in one slide, it's a very small extension to support coding up authenticated data structures. The idea is that we will take a source program that very much resembles the normal code that you would write in ML for a data structure, and then we will compile from that two versions of that code, one that runs on the server, which we call the prover, the other that runs on the client, which we call the verifier. And what we can do is we can prove that 
by virtue of the program, the original program being type correct, the authenticated versions, the verifier and prover's versions, when they uh, participate in this protocol, it will be both correct, that is, if they follow the protocol, they'll get the right answer, and secure, that is, if the prover attempts to subvert the protocol and lie by going down the, the wrong path in the tree, then the client is going to discover that in, with very high probability. Uh, and we have an implementation of this idea. We made a small extension to the OCaml compiler, and we have used it to code up, as far as we know, all existing authenticated data structures plus many interesting variations. OK, so how does it work? So this is the main idea. So you have a purely, purely functional programming language, so uh, and all the standard features that you would expect with data types and recursive types and uh, recursive functions and base types and so on. But it's purely functional, so no refs. Uh, we'll see why in a little while, why uh, refs would be problematic. And then we're going to add a new type called off t for authenticated of t. And we have two constructors, two coercions, one that, int that uh, introduces authenticated types from their regular uh, variants, and another which unauthenticates them, which turns them back into regular types so that we can compute on them as we expect. Then we'll have, a diff we'll have two different evaluation modes, one for the prover, one for the verifier. The prover is going to produce this proof that I showed you before, this list of these little um, objects that it's going to send back. And the verifier is going to consume this proof. And what we'll be able to show is that in an ideal mode, that is a mode in which we can ignore what authenticated types are doing, we're going to be able to relate both of the res these results back to that mode to say that we got the correct answer. So let me just make abundantly clear what ideal mode is. Ideal mode is the identity, that is, uh, in the ideal mode, authenticated types are just regular types, and auth and unauth are the no-op coercions. And so when you write code in our language, um, it looks just like the code you would write for a regular binary search tree in OCaml, except for the appearance of these auth and unauth and uh, the, both the types and the coercions. So what is, this, uh, what is this type? So the binary search tree is just um, a, a nothing at the leaf, and then bin is, uh, is a regular node where it stores some value, and then, of course, it has a left child and a right child. And in our case, the left child and the right child are going to be authenticated. Um, so you can think of it as this is where um, we're going to be storing these cryptographic hashes. So I'll make that clear on the next slide. We're going to, when we uh, compute over this thing, you'll match over the unauthenticated version of the tree. So you have to do unauth on, on tree because tree is an authenticated type. So we coerce it back to its normal tree, and then we can pattern match on it, and then do the standard thing in order to, uh, to look up membership in the tree. The integer is not authenticated, that's right. So uh, it, it, it's going to be by virtue of how this all works. So um, hold on to that thought, and, and we'll see. OK, so now let's look at how the prover and verifier modes work. These are going to do something interesting with authenticated types. And they actually have two different views of how uh, authenticated types are represented. And so these two views are shown here on the right-hand side. The first um, that's stored at the server in our initial example is just the tree with all of these little um, hashes, the, the diamonds, stored at various nodes. And then on the client, it's just the hash itself. So let's make that a little more specific. At the prover, a value of type auth t is a pair where v has type t, and d is a cryptographic hash of what we call v's shallow projection which we write sp of v. Um, pictorially, we write these little diamonds for, uh, for the hashes. The idea with the shallow projection is that we're going to um, serialize the data up to, but not past, any nested authenticated types. And then we'll take the hash of all of that. So for example, here in this tree, the shallow projection of the root is just going to be this node. OK, so we'll go down one level. We're at that bin node. The bin node has three elements, um, a left tree and a right tree. Those are both authenticated, so we stop computing the shallow projection there. And then we just have the integer. So we have the value at the node, and we have the two hashes. And then we'll serialize that up into some linear representation, and we'll take the hash of the whole thing. So you can see the analogy with the Merkle trees that we saw before, that each of those nodes had the interior nodes, had the left tree and the right tree, the two hashes next to each other, and then we took the hash of those things for the next level up. We're doing the same sort of thing here, except in our data structure, we have the, the integer stored at each node rather than only at the leaves. Because if it had been a pair of integers, you'd have serialized that. If there was a tree of integers with no authentication, you'd serialize all of that. Exactly. Okay. Exactly right. Okay. And at the verifier, a um, auth authenticated type 
and auth t value is just the cryptographic hash. Okay, and so that you can see here that the relationship between these two things, the prover mode and the verifier node, the verifier mode is giving you this compression. I don't have to see all the data, I don't have to maintain the tree myself, I just maintain the hash, whereas at the prover I get the entire, the entire tree. Okay, so now let's look at the representation, the semantics of the different coercions, the auth and unauth coercion. So the auth coercion, auth v is gonna return this pair, dv, where d is the cryptographic hash in the way we just described. It's the hash of the shallow projection of v. And the verifier is just gonna return the hash because the verifier's representation is only the hash and not the value. Okay, so the interesting part is the unauth case. So this is where the proof comes into play. Um, the verification object is a list of shallow projections of authenticated values. And how is that list produced? Well, at the prover, we're gonna do unauth on an authenticated type. At the prover, authenticated types are dv pairs. So what we'll do is we'll um, compute the shallow projection of v and stick it onto the verification object and then just return v so that we can subsequently pattern match over it just as we uh, showed a moment ago. At the verifier, at the corresponding position, you're gonna do an unauth. What unauth of d will do is it will pull off from um, the head of the verification object, the current shallow projection, and it will confirm that the hash of that shallow projection is in fact the hash that it currently has in its hands. So, so I think you're implicitly implying that there's, there's an operational semantics for yeah. this language that has a global verification object and a certain evaluation order, and these unauth calls. That's correct. I'm gonna show you the operational semantics in two slides. Oh, okay. and then, then at some point, pulls that list off and then that's the thing that you know. Right, that's what's happening. So you can think of it as the prover is producing each of these elements, right? We saw them, the little list. That's these shallow projections. And the verifier is basically running the same code, right? It's the same code in two modes, except auth and unauth are interpreted differently. Every time the verifier reaches an unauth, where the prover would have produced one of these elements from the, from the list, the verifier pulls it off and confirms the hash that it has corresponds to the hash of the thing that was on the list. So, uh, so let me show you the operational semantics and then I'll make it abundantly clear. Um, so it's just a small extension to uh, call by value, simply type lambda calculus semantics, we'll see that. We use a normal form just to keep things simple. And uh, instead of actually doing compilation in the formalization, um, we just have three different evaluation modes where the, auth, the semantics of auth and unauth and so on are different depending on which mode you're in. And uh, we've proved the correctness and security properties and I'll, I'll show you formally what those mean. So this is the syntax and semantics of the language, or sorry, the syntax and some of the type rules for the language. So um, all of this stuff is standard except for these things. Uh, function types, sum types, product types, recursive types, um, all the standard stuff that you would expect, plus these two additional forms. And the type rules correspond to the, the typing that I showed you earlier, okay? So now let's look at the semantics. So there's basically three modes. You start with that program that we showed before, the membership. At least, at least you, you request it as a syntactic form. Can you say map auth over something? And I mean, in other words, not have it. No, uh, it's, it's, it is, it's syntactic also in the implementation. Uh, I'll show you why. Well, I suppose you could say map lambda x auth x. Yes, you, you, no, you yeah. could. That's right, you could do that. That would be fine. That would be perfectly fine. So in effect, they're, they're first, pretty perfectly first. So, so yes, but hold that thought. And I'll, I'll tell you where some complications come in. Um, okay, so, so um, yeah, so then we have the, the source program, and we're going to think of these three variants of the program. We're not going to really compile it, but in our implementation we will. So we'll think that we have the ideal version, the prover's version, and the verifier's version. And in all three modes of evaluation of our source term, the semantics is going to be sort of the standard thing. So this is just showing the rules for um, case expressions over some types, and also projections over product types. And our judgment is just going to take a, a pair, a configuration, where pi is the, is the verification object, and the term right next to it is the value that we're reducing. And that's going to take one step to the new verification object, whatever that happens to be, and the one step reduction of the original source term. So what we can see is that for all the standard terms in the language, the proof stream there, pi, right, it doesn't change. I have pi here, I have pi here. So doing a case or a projection or a um, application or whatever, it doesn't change anything. And this is true in all three modes. In the ideal mode, um, as I already mentioned to you before, 
auth v is just a no-op, unauth v is just a no-op, and it does nothing to the proof stream. Okay, so the idea is that when we look at our code and we think about sort of morally what it would do if we didn't split it out into this prover and verifier part, we should be thinking about this ideal mode. We're just going to sort of run normal binary search trees as usual, and we're going to ignore these silly no-op coercions, and that's what the semantics is making clear. Okay, so now let's look at um, the semantics for the prover and the verifier modes. Uh, on the left here is the semantics of shallow projection. So we write it as this, whatever, this little uh, function. And uh, shallow projection is just a congruence where the congruence quits when it hits one of these authenticated values. So an authenticated value is a hash uh, followed by a value. Oh, that's an unfortunate notational difference, right? So it's the same as D, which I was showing you before. So I have this pair, which is the hash and the value. When I'm doing a shallow projection, I stop when I get there and I just return the hash. And then otherwise, I just recursively descend into the term, as you might expect. Auth of V is not a value, no. Oh, so why have we got a case for it? Because we just have values inside these shadow No, values. no, we don't. We, because we're going to descend into lambda terms, too. Oh, I see. So we've got, well, there's a whole bunch of other rules, like case and so forth. Yeah, yeah. they're all congruences. That's what I just said. Oh. I could show you all of them, but they would be telling you the same thing. So this shallow projection thing, which I, you previously said was something to do with you serialize a data structure and produce a hash. Now we're actually going to serialize code, too. We Is are potentially going to serialize code. We can make anything authenticated, into, including closures. All right. It's not scary. Code is just data, and data is just code, right? Come on. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so here are the, here are the rules for um, off for the prover and the verifier. So notice the little index here, which says which, what the modes are. So for the prover, auth um, is going to take the shallow projection uh, according to these rules, and then it's going to compute the hash of it, and it will couple it with the value. So just what I said before. Now here it is formally. And then interestingly here, I'm not taking the shallow projection because, as it turns out, you might have already observed this, the relationship between the representation of data on the prover and the verifier nodes, modes is that at the verifier, the value is the shallow projection of what it was at the prover, right? So remember, the prover had the entire tree, and the verifier has just the hash of the tree. Well, just the hash of, the, of that tree, that, that is the hash of um, the shallow projection of something of type dot tree is just the hash, right, according to this definition right up here. So this already is, in some sense, the shallow projection, and so we just have to take the hash of it. OK, so now the interesting part um, is unauth. Unauth is going to um, take the shallow projection of the value that it's, uh, that it's working with and stick it on the end of the verification object and then just return the value itself. So again, this value is an authenticated value. On the prover, that's a pair of H and T. So what we'll do is the verification object is, as I said, a list of these shallow projections. There we go. We take the shallow projection. We stick it on the list. We return V and, and carry on. Now, on the verifier, we're going to be doing consuming this verification object in the same way. So now we're going to be taking off whatever is at the front of this list. We're going to compute the hash of it and make sure that it matches the hash that we think that we should have uh, on the verifier side. If this hash matches, then this step is allowed to proceed, and we're basically uh, dequeuing the thing from the verification list. Yep? So the reason I'm confused is why, why is there a transition P of V in the verifier? Um, why is there this transition? No, 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 in the, in the previous, in the, the... This one. This one, yes. What, because auth and unauth have semantics in both cases. So, um, so what, 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 let me, actually, here, I'll show you just a second. You're, <coughs> I, I, it's, a, it's a fair question. Okay, so we already saw this, this query. Uh, here's where you need auth uh, on the verifier. This is the, well, this is a, remember, there's just code, right? And we can run it in verifier mode or prover mode. So if you ever would use auth, you need an interpretation of it at the verifier. But you might rightfully ask, look, we didn't even use auth anywhere in this query. Why do you need auth ever? And the answer is for insertions. If you ever construct authenticated data, you need to authenticate it. So here, I'm inserting something into a tree. So I have to do auth of all of these things. And at the verifier, I'm going to have to add this new node to the tree, so I'm going to have to compute the shallow projection and the hash and so on to make these new nodes. Uh, so that's where this will happen. I should say that this is one way in which our language 
uh, improves on what people have done before. A lot of the time when people make authenticated data structures, they only do queries for them. They just assume there's some out-of-band process by which a trusted person makes the, the, the modifications to the data structure, and you're only authenticating the queries. We can authenticate whatever you want to do. This was my model. Yeah, so this, anyway, so what would happen here, this is returning a new tree. So what would happen is the, the server would actually return a new hash that the verifier would now start using as the new root of the tree. Okay. Uh, I've got one other question, which is, uh, um, see, I've, I've kind of lost track of what, what the things on the verification object are. Those S zeros, what type are they? Are they hashes or are they data um, structures? They are, they, it's hard to say what their type is. They are, um, they are shallow. Well, see, the problem is that they're sort of in between these two modes. So they're shallow projections um, where I guess basically they're, they're the verifier's representation of something of, uh, of, of the type that you did unauth on, if that makes any sense. So if, in other words, if, um, if I had something of auth t and I called unauth on it on the prover, then what will be on the verification object will be something of type T from the verifier's point of view. So something of type T from the verifier's point of view has everything of authenticated type as being just the hash. And that's basically what a shallow projection is. But do we, can we take shallow projections apart? Can we pattern match on them or something? Or is it just a string of bits? Uh, no, no, it is a regular, I mean, see what's happening here is I'm taking this thing off and it's now, I'm now computing on it. So, I mean, it is a regular term. Uh, it's just the verifier's representation of the term, that's all. Okay, so it is a term. Yeah, absolutely. It's the verifier's representation of something of type T, where the unauth that produced it was operating on type auth T. Okay, so the term that we pushed on on the line above was square brackets of shallow projection of V. Oh, the square brackets, that's just the list element. Uh, yeah, that's right. I see, and the shallow projection thing is... That's right. So if, if this whole thing was of type auth t, then this thing uh, here is going to be the verifier's version of something of type t. I see. So it's, a, it's still a term. I was misled by you. You said it was something to do with serialization. So you have to, in order to, to in, in practice, in order to hash it, you have to serialize it. You're not hashing okay. structural terms, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But the hashing takes place on that arrow p line. The hashing takes place. Two lines above, two lines up, there. This that's is where, ha right, where things that's are where being you hash a shallow projection. So at that moment, you might serialize it. But this guy, the guy that says the, 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 second, the second rule from the bottom. This one here. Yeah, that's right. Right, there's, there's, no, serial, there's, there's no hashing happening here. We're just, just pushing the shallow projections. Oh, okay. The hashing is being confirmed right. here. All right, thanks. So, so right. it is that in as much yeah. as the prover and the value know exactly what's the type of the value they are reading or writing. That's right. But uh, it changes all the time. Uh, yep, that's right. Yeah, so, so, um, right, so the key here is that we're, we're running the same code on both sides, right? And all we're doing is interpreting auth and unauth differently. So as you said in the very beginning, there's an assumption of evaluation order and so on, so that when the verifier reaches an unauth, it's the corresponding unauth that the prover used to produce the particular element in the stream that it's now going to get to compute on. Okay, so, so let me um, uh, show you what the security theorem says. Uh, what it says, first of all, is correctness. If the prover does the right thing, if, we, if the prover is, is uh, not trying to lie to us, then the verifier will get the right answer. And that's to say that the prover and verifier's final results will agree. And I'll formalize what agree means in a minute. Uh, security says if the verifier gets an incorrect answer, so I got three instead of four, then the only way that that was possible is if the prover was able to discover a hash collision, which we're going to assume is computationally difficult because we're going to use a collision-resistant hash function for our hash function. Uh, and the nice thing is that this is a constructive proof. That is, I can actually show you the hash collision in the proof. It's not sort of a conceptual thing. It's, no, here's the hash collision that they must have found uh, in order for this wrong answer to have occurred. So let me formalize for you what agree means. So intuitively, you can think agree is the same, right? So if I do a query um, at the prover and it produces, it says, oh, you, the, the, this element is three, then at the verifier, I'd also get three. Okay, that's fine. 
The only problem is that, well, what if the query that um, returns something that is itself authenticated? If the query returns an int, well, then agreement means syntactic identity. But if instead, um, on the prover, you would return something that's authenticated, like for our insertion example that I just showed you, uh, the, the computation is going to return an authenticated tree. Well, on the client and the, the, the prover and the verifier, the representation of these things are actually different. They're not going to be syntactically the same. So what we have to do is we have to formalize what we mean by agree as being sort of morally the same. So all of these rules just say I can relate all three of these terms, the ideal version, the uh, verifier's version, and the prover's version. And for everything, uh, all the standard term forms in the language, it's just it's the same. The interesting case is that um, is this case where we have these three different representations. So when I have a value that's of type auth t on the uh, ideal mode, when we pretend we're not doing authenticated stuff, it's just something of type t. That is, it's a v. If it's on the prover side, it's the hash and some value. And if it's the verifier side, it's just the hash. So first of all, we can see that for these values to agree, these two hashes have to be the same. It's certainly not going to be the case that if you have an authenticated value, if the prover would have come up with one hash, the correct prover, and the verifier comes up with a different hash, well, then these terms clearly can agree. The other part that's interesting is, well, how does V relate to VP? So you might immediately think, oh, V and VP ought to be syntactically the same, but we have the same problem because VP might be a recursive type that itself contains a bunch of authenticated things. So therefore, what we need to do is we need to recursively make sure that all of these things agree one level down. And agreement needs to be on the shallow projection of VP, since, again, the verifier's representation of something at the prover side is always its shallow projection. So then we just make sure these agree, and we make sure that this hash of the shallow projection is, in fact, the hash H that we have. So all of the invariants that I have been saying all the way up through this talk are expressed in this one rule and say uh, the terms will agree if all of these invariants are satisfied. Yeah? But the relation isn't necessarily functional, so, right? Because the hash is mine. Uh, no, actually, it is, it is functional. It is functional. So you could just write a function, not a relation. Uh, that's a good point. Function from what to what? Well, from one semantics to another. Well, there are three, so... Well, <laughs> from one semantics to another and to another. From the ideal to... <laughs> yeah, you, you could do it that way. It's a fair point. From the ideal to P and from the ideal to I. Yeah. I mean, we're always talking about all three things at once, so... Sorry? There's no gamma in the top line. Oh, yes, yes. So that's important because... Um, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we don't want any free variables showing up inside of these terms because if there were free variables, then they could be substituted differently, and that would be bad. So the lack of the gamma makes sure that values are actually closed, which in a call-by-value semantics, you, sh you should be only starting with executing of closed terms anyway. And these gammas are only here for descending into lambda terms when we're doing agreement as part of the congruence. Uh, so it's just saying that values, yeah, that, value, that values of type auth t as opposed to terms that might be off of something that have type auth t, values should always be closed. And values will never show up in source programs. They'll only show up as a re result of evaluation. So that angle back at you would never appear under a lambda. Correct. That's, that's, that's Ab absolutely. Right Excellent observation. Okay. Yeah. So can you uh, try different strategies on the prover side? Like uh, here, you are keeping a hash of everything. Uh, locally at every place, but uh, in principle, you can recompute them on the fly, or... Uh, or uh, but what, so you're, oh, I see what you're saying. Um, so this, uh, this uh, seems to work for one strategy, uh, where you uh, pre-compute all the hashes on the prover side. That's, that's a good point. Uh, so our semantics doesn't do that. Uh, we have a couple of optimizations that do things differently than I'm describing here. Uh, that's not one of them, but that would be a fine optimization that you could implement. A, because the point is that you would still morally be implementing the semantics. You'd just be lazy about the computation of hashes. Uh, but I'll show, I'll, well, actually, I don't have slides for it. But assuming we have time, I can tell you about what the optimizations do. OK, so now let's formalize the security theorem. So the security theorem says, let's say we start our uh, evaluation with these three terms in agreement to begin with. So at the very beginning, when no evaluation has taken place at all, right? I just have this query in the tree, well, then they're obviously going to be in agreement because they're actually literally the same term. Uh, on the other hand, as I'm evaluating, I want to say that I preserve agreement. And so hence, I'm going to have these three, identify these three different uh, terms that are all related. So correctness says, 
Well, if the ideal mode, and I've, I've now, uh, I haven't shown you this, but I now have a new version of the semantics, a multi-step version of the semantics, which is the obvious, you know, uh, application of the transitive closure to these rules, where i is the number of steps that are actually taken. So what this says is that if in ideal mode I start with e and I take i steps to get to e prime, then if we run the prover, the same number of steps, and we give its output to the verifier, we're going to get the correct answer. Okay, and uh, one thing that's important about this is that we're relying on our language being sensible because we're assuming that it can take n steps, right? If you, if you immediately start thinking of type soundness as an analogy of what we're doing here, uh, we don't prove progress for this correctness theorem because we assume that the ideal language is already a sound language. That is, our ideal interpretation, uh, you're never going to get stuck with a, a type error because you'll have a type correct program. And therefore, we can always assume that the ideal mode can take as many steps as it, as, as it wants to. Uh, up into the point that it's a value. So in that assumption, we can say that we'll get the right output if the verification stream that the prover produced is the one that the uh, verifier actually consumes. We're going to get the, the right answer. Now, security says, well, suppose we had a malicious prover. Why do you have an i in this? Why do we, why do we have the little i here? Uh, because it's the same i. And so that's use, really useful to reason about, say, asymptotic complexity. Okay, so if you, if you said one step, then yeah, yeah, I would be one step, that would be fine. Digitally. Yes, that's right. right. So, so. Oh, I just, I don't know, just because, I mean, why do people, when they prove type soundness, prove it for the transitive closure version? Uh, just because. I mean, yes, in order to prove this, we have a bunch of lemmas that work in the one step case. And right, but if this was true for one step, it would be vacu immediately true for the n i steps, right? It, by induction on i. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, that's so, right. Okay. Fine. Exactly. There's nothing complicated. There's nothing complicated here. Wait, 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 wait a second. Because, <laughs> because so it's, it's like two, two more premises. So, so, are, so if in ideal mode the E goes to E prime and the prover produces a P and the verifier consumes it's that a, P. It's not exactly that. It's oh, saying okay. if it's in ideal mode, then the legitimate prover will also be able to take I steps and produce a proof. And assuming that it does that, the, the verifier will be consume the proof and produce the result. So with the, veri the, the only premise really is this one. If it can take this many steps, then the rest follows. OK, so security is saying, let's suppose that we, we some malicious prover produced this uh, pi a instead, where they made some random uh, verification stream to try to trick the verifier into doing the wrong thing. So what this says is that, well, either it's correct. So this is basically restating this, but slightly differently. So ignore that for a second. The more interesting case is this one, which says that if we get uh, an answer such that they don't agree, then there was somewhere along the way for some j that's less than or equal to i. So you know, if I took five steps, then somewhere before that at two or three or four, or maybe five, um, I, in, I came up to a point where my stream contained uh, the, the legitimate prover would have produced a stream that had this s here at the end. But the adversary stream, had, while having the same prefix pi 0, now has this s dagger. And s and s dagger are not the same shallow projection, but they have the same hash. Okay, So the point is, the only way we end up with an incorrect answer is if you could fool me into believing that the hash was correct, even though you didn't actually provide the correct shallow projection. Okay? In other words, you had to find a hash collision, and that's it. There's, there's the hash collision right there. Uh, alternatively, if you did give me uh, this pi, which is the same pi that the prover would have produced, and maybe you gave me a bunch of extra stuff that I don't care about, well, then everything's good, and we're going to end up with in agreement stuff. Okay? So this is the key, right? Somewhere along the way, you found, the bad guy found a hash collision. And so the security of our whole system now boils down to the standard cryptographic notion of security, which is it's hard to find hash collisions. And in the paper, we, um, we go into more detail to relate sort of the crypto people's uh, view of proving these things to how this security theorem is basically the linchpin argument in a bunch of other standard steps to proving security for authenticated data structures. that the server and the prover run the same program go? I mean, if you tried to relax that assumption, does everything fall apart? Or is it just uh, sort of convenient to, to make the argument formally in this way? Um, so when you say the server and the prover, those are normally the same role. Sorry, the, the server and the client or the Yes, right, the prover and the verifier. Uh, it's critical. They have to run the same program. They have to agree on the way that they're doing the computation. And if they, if, I mean, 
up to that up to the level of abstraction of this operational semantics. I mean, sort of what Cedric was saying. You could certainly imagine computing things differently for optimization purposes, as long as we agree on the way that we're communicating this stream of verification objects. So if the code was different, would the verifier just always say no? Pretty much, yeah. But that would be okay, as long as the verifier doesn't say yes when actually That's right, it's, exactly. Um, but, but that argument w isn't, isn't made by this proof. This or proof is basically just saying that, well, it is sort of being made by it. This proof is just saying that if the prover runs the right code, then if I consume their verification stream, I'm good. Otherwise, what it says is that the malicious prover can do whatever it wants. A any prover can do whatever it wants to produce some other stream. And we won't say anything about how it produced that stream. It could run the wrong code. It could flip coins. Who cares? It's going to produce that thing. The only way I'm going to end up with the right answer is if it morally would have done what the normal prover would have done. And if it's somehow I don't, I don't get stuck, I manage to get to the end and, and uh, think that things are okay, the only reason that's going to be true is if the, that process produced a hash collision. So you'd only get, you'd be lucky if, uh, or very, very clever, if you ran the wrong code and you still got everything to work out okay. Okay, so I, um, I don't have that much time, uh, but I'll, I'll give you a flavor of how the implementation works. So um, we extended OCaml. Uh, while in our formalism, we can handle authenticated closures, and there are actually some really nifty examples of using authenticated closures. Uh, for example, compiling programs that use CPS. Uh, it's actually difficult to do it for a statically typed language because in order for it to work, you have to know what the type of all of the values in a closures environment are. You have to know whether they're authenticated or not. And in general, if you have a function from T to T prime, you don't have any, any idea of what the type of its, of its environment is. So if, at the moment, we just uh, say, no, you can't have authenticated closures in our implementation. One easy relaxation to this would be to say, uh, we only allow closures that have empty environments, and you can make a special type for those uh, and say those can be authenticated because then I don't have to actually, I know that there are, following the invariant Simon that you pointed out, I know that there aren't any authenticated values that are in this closures, in this, uh, yeah, this closures code because the only way I could have authenticated values is if they showed up in the environment, but if the environment's empty, then I know it can't have any of them. Uh, so we, we could do things that way, and, and, but in any, in any case, we don't. Uh, so we've implemented a whole bunch of ADSs. So you've already seen uh, uh, binary search trees, but we have a bunch of other ones. Um, OK, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll show you the code. So it's cool. This is the whole implementation. It's one slide. Um, OK, so what's, a, what's an authenticated value? Well, it's a. You didn't have to modify the OCaml compiler. We, we sort of did. You'll see why in a second. Oh, okay. um, so there, there's, this is the, the verifier's representation is the digest of the string, and the prover's representation is, again, the hash and the value. So um, auth at the prover is auth prover, and here's where we had to modify the compiler. So in order to compute the shallow projection, we need to have a function that computes the shallow projection for the value of type alpha. If we were implementing this in scheme, we could just run code that ran through any arbitrary term and figured out how to compute its shallow projection at runtime. Because we're doing it in a statically typed language, we can't do that. So we have to, at compile time, generate the shallow projection functions for whatever uh, types we're interested in. So our generic implementation takes the shallow projection function as an argument along with the type. Uh, and there, our little preprocessor inserts the shallow projection function every place at the prover. You do one of these auth calls. Right, so polymorphism and closures are where this strategy falls down. Um, but otherwise, this implementation is just matching the semantics rules, right? It's computing the shallow projection and making these little values. And in this case, it's um, uh, unauth is sticking it on this channel, which is the verification stream, whereas for the verifier, it's pulling it off the channel, and then it's doing the assertion and returning the result. Okay, so this is just OCaml code for the semantics that I already showed you and for the text that I showed you before that. So there's a default shallow projection for authenticated values, right? That was the one rule that I circled on the math, that if I have uh, an HV, well, then the shallow projection of that is just the digest itself. It's just the H part. Um, the shallow projections for everything else are going to be automatically generated by our compiler. So this is just, suppose we had this user code, then these would be the two shallow projection functions that would be produced. I'm just going to gloss over it for time purposes. Uh, we also have these. So basically, this shallow projection is operating on the entire BST type. And then it will also compute the shallow projection of this guy, which is, 
is computed right down here. And then we have auth and unauth uh, functions that use those shallow projection um, functions that we just generated that will be stuck in at that point in the code, right? So every place we see auth of something of type t, we'll generate a shallow projection function for t and we'll plop it in there on the, on the prover side. The shallow projection one needs to be generated. It's only two channels. This also needs to actually... It has to be polymorphic, yeah. So, but it actually, actually has to serialize things. That's, that's right. right. So you've got two generic functions. Yes, that's generic. correct. The You're shallow right. projector and the serializer. Right. right, and the serializer, OCaml is actually generic or whatever with that. You can give it anything. Of type out, yeah, that's right. Okay, so we saw binary search trees. Um, there you go. So here's some interesting uh, performance numbers. So this is um, uh, the running time for 100,000 insertions into uh, into a tree, um, and the, the, as the tree gets bigger, uh, the time you know t takes uh, longer. The ideal case is here at the bottom. So if we just made auth and unauth and no op, this, this is how long it would take. And uh, the times up here are for the prover and the verifier. So you can see that the, uh, the verifier is a little bit slower than the prover. And that's because the verifier has to end up doing uh, hashing twice. It has to do, uh, let me think of why that is. It's because, it, sorry, the prover, no, why is it? Oh, I, yes, right, hashing happens in both auth and unauth on the verifier, right? It has to do a hash to confirm the thing that comes off the stream, and it also has to do a hash on auth, whereas for the verifier, uh, sorry, for the prover, it only will ever do hashing on auths and never on unauths because it already has the hashes sitting in its data structure. So that's why it's a little bit slower. And you can see that most of the runtime overhead, 85% of what the code is doing is hashes. It's either serialization or hashing. And that's why it's 100 times slower than the original OCaml stuff. So if you didn't, we use 160-bit SHA-1 hashes. You can make smaller hashes, but you know, you're, you're reducing your security guarantee. You could also be, um, you could also be smarter about serialization. So we, um, we use the default serializer. You could also, just like we compute shallow projection functions, you could imagine statically generating smarter serialization functions, and that would save you a lot of time, too. So I'm just wondering if you knew where the rest of it was going, because... Oh, the, the extra 15%? No, 85% is only six times slower. Yeah. So does 100 said 99% went into this, then we'd understand right, it's right. 100 times slower. Um, no, I haven't figured that. I, we, we haven't looked into it. I guess I, I, you make a good point. We should. We should figure that out. Um, okay, right. And here at the bottom, interestingly, it also takes a whole bunch of time to do garbage collection because it's going to compute a lot of stuff and throw it away, uh, whereas it, it won't on the, on the verifier side. So over here, it shows space usage. So this is where the rubber hits the road. This is the whole reason we're doing authentication in the first place. So what this shows is that, look, as you add more and more stuff to your tree, right, your tree takes up more space. Um, that's going to be true for both the prover and the ideal case. You can see for the prover, it's just a constant factor above the ideal. That's all these extra hashes, or well, not quite constant factor, but really close. Um, all the hashes that it's maintaining at each node in the tree. Whereas for the verifier, it's roughly constant, uh, which is exactly what you want. You don't want to be... Um, maintaining any extra storage. You just have the, the hash of the root of the tree. Uh, we also compared against uh, hand-rolled Merkle trees. So we did our version of Merkle trees. We did a hand-rolled version in OCaml, and we did a hand-rolled version in C, where basically our version is a factor of two slower than the C version. The OCaml version is about 30% slower. And basically, the um, well, there's, there's several interesting distant differences, uh, but mostly it's you know overhead of a naive compiler. Um, Okay, so I didn't, the, the optimizations that we use are uh, space saving optimization, where, um, ah, I, I shouldn't even go into it. I'll just wait and you can, you can ask me after if you're really interested. Anyhow, we have two optimizations that dramatically reduce space usage, uh, and they bring our verification procedure closer to what Merkle trees actually are doing. Um, okay, so just for kicks, we modeled Bitcoin in our language. So um, Bitcoin works by, maintaining a ledger uh, that keeps track of all of the Bitcoins that are available. And transactions are either purchasing coins, they're taking them out of the ledger, or they're sticking them back in. The blockchain, this guy here, is basically a list of transactions. So you can think of this uh, blockchain as starting off from, you know, there's just the, the root, there's the, however many coins there were in the world, and then people just keep making transactions. They either add or remove them from the ledger. So each one of these guys is just modifying by adding or removing stuff, uh, things over time. 
So it turns out that in, uh, in Bitcoin, the uh, ledger, or sorry, the uh, block list, that list of transactions is an authenticated data structure. So it basically looks like this. This is how you'd encode it in our language. There's the root of the list, and then each one of those blocks is a pointer to the next block where that pointer is authenticated. And it's uh, the transaction itself. That's the part that was pointing down that says what things you added or removed. And the reason that it's authenticated is that we, in order for each client in a decentralized way to confirm that the overall system hasn't lied about, uh, that you have an up-to-date view of what the current ledger is, uh, you don't want to maintain all of this storage locally yourself for every transaction that's in the world. So there's this decentralized way that you can go to any peers in the network in order to get the parts of the transaction chain you're missing and get yourself up to date by doing these uh, authenticated operations. So the interesting thing is that the Bitcoin people left an opportunity for optimization on the floor. Uh, this ledger here that I've written as an int set can be pretty big, right? There's lots of Bitcoins in the world. And in order for you to verify that the transactions are valid, you the client have to actually keep a copy of the current up-to-date ledger. So I think currently the ledger is like two and a half megabytes of storage. Uh, well, you don't need to do that. You can maintain, we can modify um, the ledger to instead of being implemented as just a normal set, to be an authenticated data structure like a bit red black tree. And then in the same way that you get the authenticated stuff from your peers, you can also authenticate to get just the elements of the red black tree that are relevant for the transactions that you're processing in safe space. So my claim is that uh, the reason that that hasn't happened in the past is that people always thought about authenticated data structures as building them from the ground up, right? They just thought, oh, I want an authenticated blah, and then they designed it from scratch. Whereas if they had, hi had a higher level programming language where you could see in your code, well, where's authentication happening? How's my data representation working? You could immediately start playing with these trade-offs and you could experiment with it and you could figure out what made the most sense. So I didn't show you this, but you, know, you could make versions of trees, for example, where instead of authenticating at every level, you could have leaves, nodes that had authenticated subtrees and nodes that don't have authenticated subtrees. And you could choose variously to authenticate or not to make for a space-time trade-off. You could have trees with multiple roots. You, you, know, you could do any of these things once you have a programming language that allows you to experiment. So that's what we have provided. giving essentially three semantics, could you give a monadic translation and then just change the monad? Yeah, yeah, you could. So we did that originally, and we just felt like the three semantics was clear. Uh, to be, because it just boils down to these three different rules. The, the, uh, the semantics is the same everywhere else except for those things, but yeah, you could do that. And a Andrew, the student, has a monadic semantics in Agda that he's made some progress of actually mechanizing the proof of security. Sharp, I'm thinking you could just use computation expressions. Fair enough. That's that's true. You still you still have this issue with the shallow projection operator, though. Although with F sharp, I guess because you've got runtime support for time so you, inspection. Oh, I see. Probably, okay, so maybe we should maybe we should look at an F sharp implementation. That sounds good. So, can I use your implementation to mix uh, in the same program some provers and some verifiers? So. Or uh, do I need to write smaller programs and use them together, or how can I? Can I, I, I guess you would have to. You, you would you would have to express uh, if you had different provers and verifiers. You'd probably want a, a family of auth types, right? So you'd have auth types for one prover and auth types for a different prover, and then absolutely you could mix them. And the you know the verification stream would have to tag which elements of the verification stream are for which prover uh, versus a different prover. So instead of the big dot, I will index them by. Uh, and then That's use right. them immediately. I think that that would work. But, it, but the point is, I mean, back to Josh's question, the key is that you have to get the verifier and the prover to agree. So they just have to know where they are in the process of computing to know how they're going to do this verification process. So if you want to use different provers, um, you just have to, the verifier just has to know that, has to know where it's going to get the information. Yep. So, uh, this is not a very articulate question, but you've, the whole type of your talk is, authenticated data structures, right? But is it really anything to do with data structures? Because what you hand over to the, what the prover hands over is some kind of trail to the, you know, to the client that says, well, that, that amounts to a proof that he executed the program that you thought. It's nothing to do with data structures, is it? I so mean, the reason that it has to do with data structures is that it's about storage of data structures. So it, the, the, well, because if I, 
I, I still get all of the proofs if I don't have any dots in my types anywhere, right? If I just write functions. But then what will happen is the prover and the verifier will actually run the same code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're doing verification by re-execution, which is not very interesting. So, so you sprinkle it with some dots. And that's, that's right. And so that's why it's about data structures, because the dots are saving you storage about the representation that you're doing these operations over. And if you weren't worried about storage savings, then you wouldn't care about this. So uh, yeah. maybe you. Uh, what about uh, mutations and consistency? Oh, right. Uh, there is no mutation. Uh, we, mutations, are all, mutations are functional, right? So the insertion function that I showed you before is going to produce a new tree that will share a whole lot with the old tree. The reason that mutations is bad, I'm sure you realize this, which is why you asked, is that if you modified something, all of the hashes of the things that eventually refer to it will now be invalid. So if you supported mutation, you'd have to be able to go back and fix up all of those hashes. But in that case, you might as well just encode mutation however you like so that you make sure that you, in, you fix up all the hashes the way you expect. So you could, you, know, you could encode mutation with an index and a list and so on, and you could make sure in this purely functional way that everything was, was up to date. Right. But even, even in the case where you produce a new tree, for example, or whatever, a new authenticated structure, right? How do you authenticate that the mutation uh, is valid? Well, the new tree is valid given that several clients were trying to produce a new tree at the same time. Oh, because you're assuming, I see what you're saying. Uh, okay, well, let's assume for a moment there's one server and the clients are all just accessing the one server. Well, the server is going to serialize their requests, right? So, the, so what would have to happen is um, if your request came in expecting to operate on tree T, so you'd provide your hash for the tree, but some other client snuck in and modified the tree and updated its hash, your hash and the server's hash wouldn't match anymore. And then you would say, no, no, I can't perform this because you have the wrong tree. And then the server would have to send back the, the proper hash. Server actually tells different clients different hashes. Right. And so in that case, so, so you're asking a higher level question, which is how can you use the prover and verifier infrastructure to build sort of a, an authorized data structure that might be mirrored in a certain way? So probably what you want to do is you want to only allow uh, trusted parties to perform insertions. And so then what would happen is the trusted parties would then have to propagate the hash to the clients to say, look, I just did this insertion. Here's the new hash. And that's the hash that you should trust. So, um, but how does this work in that case for Bitcoin? Because the ledger forks all the time. It's, well, you, you already have this problem, right? You, it, it's the same issue in Bitcoin with the transaction history. Um, the way that you do it in Bitcoin is you look for consensus among the miners. You make, you make sure that everybody agrees on uh, what they, the yeah. Right, so the point is, we're just giving you this way of, of separating the storage, and then you're gonna, you may have to build stuff on top of it to make sure that things work out the way you want. We're out of time, but uh, let's thank